are aspects of this uh, study that are not uh, captured by most uh, traditional theories. Um, in the Philippine context, this is not yet uh, well studied, but in other countries, there are lots of literature already. Um, urban and rural, while can be used uh, for descriptive purposes, there is a, uh, a principle of a continuum that should be uh, understood. Uh, we don't, the, the, the danger of treating urban and rural as separate will, will uh, result to uh, difficulty in uh, addressing issues and concerns. Because what happens in the rural will eventually affect the, the urban. And the same with the way that what happens in the rural will affect rur uh, urban areas. From literature, um, Takoli in 2015 stated explicitly that from a policy perspective, infrastructure is very important for the rural-urban linkages. But she uh, emphasized that it, is, it should not be limited to connecting uh, urban areas, the large urban centers to rural areas. And urbanization is not merely the growth of cities, but is also the more often, more important in terms of demographic and economic terms, the growth of intermediate and sm small urban centers. So uh, infrastructure is very important, but there should be a caution about this, that it should not only be connecting urban and rural, but there are critical considerations. So uh, this study will primarily benefit uh, decision makers, particularly those in government. Um, it contributes to uh, the body of knowledge for development management field. Uh, by the way, I'm, my specialization is development management. In the Philippine context. And of course, it will benefit other sectors as well, like the business, the non-government organizations, and the funding agencies, because of a better understanding of rural-urban interactions. And it can inform identification of strategic interventions that can address issues and concerns, including that first slide that I have shown about the tragedy that happened. Um, the general objective is to analyze the interactions and uh, with the aim of identifying policy implications. Specifically, it is looking, it look into na the nature and extent, the factors that influence, the issues, problems, and gaps, and the aspects of national and local policies that affect uh, the interactions. And of course, the prospects in improving the, the linkages. And all these are used were used to identify policy recommendations. This is a research question that I use. Do Ilu Ilu City and Guimaras need each other? So let me, me tell you uh, what I found out. I, I used the theoretical framework of uh, Mr. Cesar O'Malley uh, when he did a study with the School of Urban and Regional Planning, UP Diliman, in 1987. And I was glad that uh, later on, uh, I was able to work with him. I'm working with him now. <laughs> I, I use his uh, paper, I use his charitable framework, and now we're working together in a project. It is about um, describing the market mechanism that exists. And from development studies, especially urban rural sociology, um, tells us that Rural areas provide surplus labor and primary goods to urban areas. And uh, urban areas provide wages, employment opportunities, social services, and uh, processed goods to rural areas. So this is a, um, uh, by, this, by this model, it looks like it's a, a perfect mechanism. But in reality, there are things that uh, are not so perfect. Uh, uh, based on this, I developed a conceptual framework to look into the, the study. Um, I look into the interactions using both spatial flows and sectoral activities, meaning uh, physical, geographic, and the sectoral activities. 
analyze the nature and extent of interactions uh, to include social, economic, physical, infrastructure, the governance aspect, and also the historical between the two areas. And identify and analyze the factors that influence both facilitating and uh, hindering uh, issues and problems were, were identified and these are, were used to develop uh, recommendations in terms of policy and uh, the interventions needed. I use the mixed methods approach. This is primarily a, uh, a mix of quantitative and qualitative data uh, which I analyze, I uh, use both secondary and primary data, those uh, that I gathered myself and those that are already available in the as service statistics, and use a lot of uh, key informants interviews. Did a lot of in-depth in interviews that were used to generate explanations for the quantitative data. So while the data were there, the qualitative aspect uh, were used to provide explanation why those things, why those uh, numbers are there. So this is what I found out. First, the interaction has been there for over a century. And there are books and journals uh, to support the, the existence. And one of, that, uh, of those is uh, the book by Campbell Downsey. Uh, she's an English woman uh, who lived or in the Philippines, who stayed in Ilo, Ilo City, and published a book in 1905. That's how the the boats used to look like, and these are the the seafarers, and these are the descendants of uh, the people of Guimaras, who has been crossing the Ilo, Ilo Strait since time immemorial. So this. Study, this survey actually provided a lot of insights. I was glad that the uh, provincial government, Guimarães, actually did a survey in 2015. And this is what I found out, that the daily average of passengers crossing through the four transit points, that is in Ortiz, Parola, Jordan, and Vita Vista. For those who are familiar with Guimarães, so cross over, you're familiar with this. And you've seen the situation, no? So these are the four transit points, and there are there is an average of 18,000 passengers. This may be the same persons, but they cross and they, they use the terminals more than once a day. And there are actual count of about 18,000 people who pass through the four transit points in one day. The highest number was at Hordan Wharf, uh, close to 6,000 a day. And Saturday and Monday are the days with the highest number of passengers, while Friday is the least. The, the days has significance. It explains the interactions, the pattern. No? Mondays, why? Students cross over. Saturdays, people from Guimaras go home. And also people from Ilo, Ilo City go to Guimaras, to the beach areas. It is interesting to note that the dominant commuter groups are workers and students. Combined, they account for 61% of the total passengers. So this, this signifies a, a, um, an interaction anchored primarily on economic employment and education. Because despite the presence of a, uh, a tertiary education facility in Guimaras, uh, students still cross over and still study in Iloilo. Ilo. Uh, there is a soon to be a university in uh, Guimaras, but it is interesting to note that uh, people still opt to study in the city. And I also found out from a um, some sample uh, uh, survey that there are a significant number of students enrolled who are from Guimaras who are enrolled in. Ilo, Ilo City universities and colleges. So I was able to find that out. And it's very, very interesting. And I, I related it, I compared it with the enrollment of the, the Guimaras State College and I found out that there are still, it's, it's still not a very, very significant slice who prefer or opt to stay, uh, study there, but still decide to study in the city. 
So this explains the the I know the this explains the high number of uh, people crossing. What else? Uh, then okay. So I did not stop there from the data. I did additional work in gathering uh, data from primary sources, and I triangulated the data. One of these is the from the the boat operators themselves, the Hordan Motor Banka Cooperative. And I found out that based on actual data, there are 12,000 from Hordan alone in Ortiz a day. And actually, the actual data is not is bigger than the survey. And I estimated it uh, based on unrecorded number of passengers. There are special trips that are no longer recorded. And it is about 20,000 people per day. And that, this, is, this was in 2000, I know, 2018, 17, 18. So you can imagine what it is now. No? The, the interaction is quite intense. Then um, it provides, it results to a significant addition to the daytime population of Iloilo City. So with, with the daytime population of Iloilo City ballooning to several thousands no? during uh, the daytime, Yumaraz is one of the major contributors. Approximately 10,000 workers and students are in the city during the day. Some stay in uh, boarding houses, and that's temporary migration. So based on urban-rural sociology, there is a um, uh, dynamics in, in these interactions. Uh, there are still, based on the survey of the Gimaraz provincial government, are classified unemployed. So uh, this can be business people, this can be uh, those engaged in, uh, in uh, businesses, in trades, no? that they don't classify themselves as employed. And uh, this one, I, I did a lot of uh, KIIs and in-depth interviews to explain why there are approximately 5,000 senior citizens that pass through the transit points during the seven-day period. There are still those people who are, some are even not ambulant, some even are, cannot walk without assistance, but still cross, despite the, the difficult crossing, still cross to the city. And what I found out is that they still need to be here because their, their, their doctors are here, they buy medicines in the city, they claim their pensions in the city, and they need to go to the malls as well. So they need to cross, despite the difficult transport facilities. So um, this is quite significant. And this contributes, of course, to the daytime population of the city, the traffic, and all the, the pressures. Right? In terms of products, I found out this is very interesting. Native chicken is the most significant product shipped to Ilo Ilo city, city from Guimaras regularly. And 99.5% of the native chicken produced in Guimaras are supplied to Iloilo City. Only 0.5% remain in Guimaras. <laughs> so that's the reason why <laughs> most of the chicken there are those... <laughs> the uh, Guimaras people ship their chicken to the Iloilo Ilo City and consume uh, the, the broiler <laughs> ones. And uh, uh, which, uh, where does, does this uh, go to? No? Uh, the value chain analysis of the chicken industry uh, found out that these are supplied to Ilo City in the prominent in the popular restaurants in the city in the resorts. No? Fishery products regularly ship 20 tons every three months, and then the inbound cargoes uh, provide an indication of what transpires. Uh, primarily consumer goods and processed products, farm inputs, construction materials are shipped from the city to Guimaras. Right. So it is an exchange is consistent with uh, the tourists that urban areas provide this and rural areas provide this to the city. Now for tourist arrivals, this is how intense it is at the port area in Iloilo City in Ortiz during the special events like the Mangahan Festival, the religious activities during uh, Holy Week. 
And the limitations of the transport facilities highlights the, the, the difficulties. This can extend to uh, almost more than 500 meters. The lines, this thick, extends up to uh, probably the University of Iloilo on that side for those familiar with the area. So um, it generates, the tourism industry creates a value chain resulting to livelihood and revenue generation. But it is very evident that it is the limitations on transport that, that's, that is limiting actually. So um, this is what I found out. The rural-urban complementary relationship Residents of Ilo, Ilo City and Guimaras exchange places during weekends to fulfill needs for leisure, relaxation, and other essential functions. Guimaras people spend an, an urban weekend in the city. Ilo, Ilo City residents spend a rural weekend in Guimaras. So they meet at the port and exchange places. Because Guimaras people need to go to the malls, to... <laughs> the urban amenities, but of course, Ilo, Ilo residents are tired of those things and during weekends, they need to go to the beach and uh, see nature, feel nature, experience the rural ambience. So it is a dynamic interaction which is evident and observable at the seaports. So this is the, the, the junction where the interaction is most intense. So now, if you imagine a scenario where there is a disruption in the main passenger sea transport mode, which is the, the small boats, and remember the, the first slide that I showed. So this is the result. After the August 3 sea tragedy, when pump boats, operations of pump boats were stopped, and people were directed to use the big boats and uh, the roll-on-roll of vessels, this is the result over a kilometer of lines of passengers. Some even can't board the boats going to the city and have to go home at night. Look at that. This is the port here, the Roro port. And the line extends up to over a kilometer. See, this is how intense it is. And just, you can just imagine, because I studied this just before the incident, you, you can imagine how I felt. I felt. I was actually wanting to, you know, to share the information even before that this can happen. And it's very sad to see the, rea the realization of the scenario that you painted in your mind based on my study, right before my eyes. This is after the August 3 incident, when boats were stopped and people were, uh, were forced to use the, the barges. Yeah. Look at that. This is not an ideal, definitely not an ideal scenario. This is unsafe, by the way. They don't have life vests. And they're just standing there at the barges. And this is the scenario at the PPA port, Philippine Ports Authority Terminal in, uh, in the Fort San Pedro area, when pump boats were not allowed because of uh, regulations during inclement weather, when it's raining, when the wave height is such, they are only permitted to uh, sail during uh, sunrise to sunset. And then afterwards, people have to flock to the, the boats, uh, the ships. And this is what happens. Exposed to the elements, but they need to do that. Because they need to go home. And then go back again in the morning to work here. And students have to go home, those who are not staying in the city. And they need to go back again to the city early in the morning to, to attend classes. So, um, well, this is one mechanism where it pro provided a lot of hope for the, the linkages, supposed to be. It's the Metro Ilo, Ilo Gimaras Economic Development Council. It was uh, created by virtue of the executive order issued by then President Gloria Magapagal Arroyo on August 28, 2006. So this is a, a good mechanism. It legitimized the alliance between uh, Ilo, Ilo City, Guimaras, and the other local governments adjoining, uh, they're adjacent to uh, Ilo, Ilo City, uh, Oton, Leganes, etc. Um, then the good thing that happened was that 
as a result of the executive order we, uh, legitimizing the alliance, uh, it attracted the donor agencies. So lots of major donors uh, entered the picture and offered assistance. Uh, one of that is AUSAID, the Canadian International Development Agency, the Asian Development Bank, and the government of Germany, and provided funds for initiatives to uh, make to assist the Migedzi realize its uh, vision of having a cohesive local de area development partnership. So uh, these plans were prepared, plenty of plans, and it actually provided the, the basis of what is supposed to be. These plans, by the way, when I analyzed it in relation to my study, it serves an, as a, a, a baseline or indication of what is supposed to happen, what is the ideal situation that should be achieved. Right? Plenty. Tourism plan, uh, infrastructure, solid waste management, integrated special development framework, technology plan, IT plan, roadmap, ecological port plan. Now, um, I realized that based on uh, the KII and data analysis, these are the key issues, problems, and gaps. There were critical gaps in consultation and participation. While there was a Megedzi, there's supposed to be providing mechanism that consulta consultative process will, uh, should take place, and it is a uh, partnership. Uh, the stakeholders should be consulted in every major decision, there were critical gaps in consultation. And there are actions of the city that actually disadvantage the other partner without consulting the partner. And this is what I'm referring to as the development where a terminal facility through a joint venture agreement of the city with a private entity resulted to imposition supposed to be of terminal fees, which will negatively affect people of Gimaraz because of additional transport costs, additional cost for transporting products and services. So this is one of the major issues. And then the political leadership changes resulted to differing, uh, different priorities. And then uh, the primacy of urban partners, meaning uh, it is the, the partners in the city that actually dominate the, the partnership funding constraints, and then the imperfect mechanism, disadvantages to rural areas, and the absence of an impact evaluation on what happened because of those plans, plenty of plans, what happened afterwards. Then uh, from the KII, uh, this is a uh, very uh, insightful result for the informant interviews. They were saying that while the, the objectives of the council is good, it started well, but it did not progress as intended. Quoting the words of one official, something went wrong. I did not know, really know what happened along the way. Started well, did that turn out well? Uh, they were actually pinpointing this as a major factor, the agreement that GBA entered by the city with a private entity and that resulted to several uh, uh, issues uh, that actually uh, strained the, the partnership no? because of the charging of terminal fees and these were not consulted with the Gimaras commuters <laughs> they just imposed it and the, even the GBA was not well uh, uh, shared with, with the partner which is supposed to be a partnership no? Because it uh, includes a provision that the new terminal operates, no other terminal in the city will be allowed to operate. So they are forced to use that without consulting them. All right. So this is a critical gap in consultation. And then the change in political leadership in the city, by the way, that resulted to the new administration taking into uh, different priorities, which actually uh, was not able to sustain the the initiative. This one, I, uh, I was really surprised to see this because uh, in one of the KIIs, 
one official said that we sometimes feel as per account of our representatives that there are prejudices by those who are in the city towards those who are not from the city. It seems like those in the city are the only ones who are smart and can understand everything. We also feel that we are not being heard. There are times that make situations worse instead of helping make the situation better. So these are direct quotes because this is, a, by the way, a mixed method. So quantitative, qualitative. So uh, the, the, the key IIs are very uh, insightful. Uh, but when, when uh, the one I entrusted to conduct the KII, because I did not conduct it personally to avoid bias, uh, she's the, the one who conducted for me said that there were requests that some of the responses may be not included. <laughs> so we respected that. But those are very revealing. <laughs> so um, uh, using the one of the theories I also use, which is the urban bias theory, it is actually very consistent. The, what happened actually was very consistent with the urban bias theory posited by Michael Lipton. Uh, when uh, he argued that poverty it persists mainly because development may be designed by and for people in the urban areas. So there is an urban bias theory. <laughs> and uh, the, the key IIs confirm it. Most poor people live in urban areas, but the towns and cities, uh, cities get a far larger share of national resources. This, he argued, was not only unjust, but also inefficient. So uh, it's surprising to see that the key IIs revealed this, no? Uh, one aspect of national policy that I found really uh, quite uh, worris worrisome is that there is, in reality, there is no national agency that actually handles, are mandated clearly to handle small boat operations. The Philippine Ports Authority the operations of the small boats is not actually covered by the pay. Yes, yes, ma'am. I, I jumped to that. <laughs> this is one uh, critical. Uh, no, no. There is a gap in policy that results to uh, those uh, from small boat operators who are not covered by uh, services. So there is another story here, but uh, I don't have time anymore. But this only shows that these commuters were not provided with the adequate facilities. They were just forced to use whatever is there. And this is the Ortiz area. Okay, uh, I consider that as well. <laughs> just to say in summary that uh, when the bridge will be there, the, the alignment will be a crucial factor. Because they were saying that it will make the pump boats obsolete or uh, redundant. But depending on the alignment, because we analyzed that if the, the alignment will be on the far north of the island, the pump boat will not cease to operate. It will still be there because of the distance. Let me just jump to the <laughs> conclusion. <laughs> so um, Ilo, Ilo City and the province of Guiaras need each other. They need it. They need each other. That's, this is what I found out. There is interdependence. It's not only dependence of one to the other, but this is, there is interdependence. The other one needs the other as well. And it has been going on for over a century. Trump, transport improvement is a crucial aspect. Policy gaps constrain the development. Uh, the Megadis started well, but not sustained. The change in leadership was a major factor. But prospects abound despite the challenges. And I recommend that uh, despite the, the difficulties, they need to look at clear policies. They need to explore tourism development. And policy gaps on the sea transport should be addressed. And an external evaluation should be undertaken. And they need to upgrade the, the, the council by having a dedicated office. But Overall, despite the challenges, the Megadzi is worth reviving. And this is a very crucial mechanism if the in, uh, linkages between Ilo, Ilo City and Gimaras uh, is desired to pursue the development uh, initiated before. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much.
Thank you also, Dr.